All right. I think I'll get started. We have all of our panelists here now. Thank you, everyone, who signed up for this event. Um, just, a, just a first note to start. Um, we're going to be recording this event. Uh, so anything you say will be recorded, and we'll hopefully be able to play this event back later on for other people to use. So that's why we're recording it. Um, so just to start, my name is Bridget Russell. I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have four amazing panelists, all University of Maryland graduates of the Clark School of Engineering. Um, and all of them have very interesting career backgrounds. Uh, all of them have taken an interesting pivot in their career, which uh, we find really important as uh, they have kind of a different perspective on things. And uh, so we'll go through some, some information about why they pivoted and, and what, what they've learned. And then we also want to talk about um, anyone in their career right now who might be new in their career or transitioning in their career and, uh, you know, use this as both a networking opportunity to meet these other professionals and also just to learn some strategies for what might help you and what our suggestions are. Uh, so without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll all introduce ourselves. Um, I graduated from University of Maryland in 2015 with a degree in mechanical engineering and I now work as a quality engineer for a medical device company called 8Cell. And I'll let the rest of the panelists introduce themselves really quick. Go oh, ahead. I'll go next. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Carol. I graduated in mechanical engineering in 2008. Um, and now I am a water resources engineer with a nonprofit in Ellicott City Center for Watershed Protection. Can go. Um, so Emily Reichard, I graduated uh, in 2010 in, with mechanical engineering, and I am now the founder of my own company uh, called Kinetic Metrics. Well, I will hop in next. Uh, I am Tom Basilino. I graduated from the University of Maryland in 2004 in mechanical engineering. I am currently a patent attorney and the proud founder of my own patent law firm in Frederick, Maryland called Bass Patent Law. And I'm Josh Mazurik. I graduated with the degree in civil engineering, uh, focused more on the water resources track uh, in 2011. Um, right now, I'm a technical program manager at Google, uh, based in Reston. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for this short introduction. Uh, for a longer career background on everyone, we have actually posted uh, information leading up to this event. Each day, we've posted career backgrounds. Uh, so feel free to check social media for that if you want a little bit more information. And you can always reach out to us afterwards. We'll, uh, we'll provide some contact information and LinkedIn links along with maybe a summary of everything we've talked about. Uh, without further ado, we'll get started. So the, the first question I have for all the panelists um, is, is why did you decide to pivot in your career? Um, you know, what kind of made you decide to make that change? And uh, Tom, why don't you start us off? Sure, my experience is, uh, is probably one that's not that relevant for the current time period that we're living through and the current uh, crises that we're going through. But I, I did it kind of out of boredom. Um, my first career <laughs> out of school was uh, as a mechanical engineer in New York City. And if you're doing mechanical engineering in a big city like New York, uh, you can get pigeonholed into the construction arena, which is where I was. And I did MEP design, mechanical electrical plumbing for skyscrapers, which was interesting at first, but then got a little redundant. And so I knew I wanted to explore another career path potentially. And uh, a seed had been planted in my head about patent law, actually in an upper level elective class at Maryland taught by Dr. George Dieter, who was awesome. Um, he noticed that I was a decent writer, uh, which was sort of a low bar for an engineer. Um, and he got me into at least researching patent law because I had no idea there was this area of law of where you needed a hard science technical degree in order to practice. And so um, I, I applied for law school and went to law school at night while uh, still maintaining my engineering career during the day, um, which was challenging on its own. Um, but yeah, no, so it was kind of a redundancy in my engineering career. but. If anything, it taught me uh, a lot of hustle, uh, you know, having one career during the day and then going to school at night. And so just a little bit of advice that I could give on that is that, you know, if you're a young engineer, younger engineer, um, and don't have too many family obligations, like now's the time to try to, you know, hustle and do more things because you'll never have more time. Like as life goes on, usually responsibilities grow and you have less time to do things. 
Thanks, Tom. Sure. Kind feel of, free to, yeah, yeah, feel free to jump in. Kind of echoing uh, uh, Tom's sentiments, but um, my, my background was really in water resources and water chemistry. When I finished up grad school, I was working kind of a similar track in design engineering. And there was, my career was progressing very much on a design perspective in the technical area that I focused on. And I was working in a role in operations at DC Water um, that was focused on kind of valve and hydrants. So whenever there was a main break, I'd be one of the people that would get the phone call. And my career was kind of going in that direction. And kind of out of the clear blue sky, um, management just presented an opportunity to join an IT project. And, you know, I kind of stepped back and was like, well, I don't, I took one programming class in undergrad. I don't really have any background. And, you know, they said something that I think, everybody on this call can can relate with is, you know, as long as you can think in a technical way and think critically, um, that in so many facets of, of the job market is really what people are looking for. So I ended up, you know, taking this project on that was focused on DC Water's billing system. And that changed my whole trajectory to away from the design and operations on water systems to more an IT role. And then that led to an opportunity to kind of fused together in my current role, I'm working on data center construction. So there's a bit of IT and a bit of the civil, hard civil engineering side. Um, so I guess the long story short is I, in the days gone by, I probably wouldn't have been so open to something completely out of my comfort zone. I would, I, my biggest lesson learned was try and embrace it. And I guess it, it's, think about roles that might be outside of your conventional focus area of what you studied in school. Uh, I can go next. Um, so my, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but engineer, uh, good job majoring engineering because it's a very <laughs> like stable career path. Like if you don't know what you want to do, like, and, and you, you're good at math and science, like engineering, you're most likely going to get a job. Um, but when I, I was actually an aerospace engineer when I first started and I didn't like it. Um, and I, it very much had to do with the time I was in college. Um, I was 2004, it was right when like the space program at NASA was really going downhill. Um, and there, everything was getting close. So like, and being in Maryland, you're basically like, if you're aerospace and you're not working on space, you're working in defense. Um, which wasn't what I wanted to do. So then I switched to mechanical only because I could graduate in four years because it's basically the same major, just aerospace is harder. Um, <laughs> so, these are all like things that just happen, right? I actually was thinking, I wanted to switch to environmental, but I would have had to take five years. I think I would, almost would have been six because I switched my junior year. Um, and so I just stuck with mechanical. Um, and so right out of graduation, I like when I was deciding whether or not a senior year I was deciding whether or not to go to grad school or not. The recession happened, so I was like, I'm "Not going to grad school. Um, I gotta get a job." Uh, so thankfully, like I just I had an internship and I worked where I interned, um, and I was one of the lucky ones at that time to have a job. Um, and it was really it's not a good time to leave in a recession, and um, it was it, it would just been really hard to go to grad school. Um, because, you know, financially, that would have just been really hard. Um, but then at my job, I actually did environmental, um, I worked for the Army uh, as a contractor, and I did, I managed their research and development projects for environmental things, uh, which was actually very interesting. But then, you know, Obama became president, and nothing happened in the government. And so literally, my job was like sitting there doing nothing. And so I was like, I can't, can't, I'm getting dumber by the day. <laughs> so I was like, this is the perfect time to go to grad school. Um, and then I took a year off and I volunteered um, with a, a Chesapeake Conservation Corps, which is just something that I wanted to do. It, like, like Tom said, when you're young, it's really the only chance you have to just do whatever you want to do and you don't have your responsibilities. Um, and so I took a year off and then I um, got a fellowship to go to Stanford um, to get my master's, well, or PhD in water resources engineering. Um, so I moved out to California, um, got my master's, and then I came back to Maryland and now I'm at my job. So. Awesome. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. So uh, my pivot was more about the approach than probably the industry. So um, out of college, I started working for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So I was doing a lot of um, safety defect engineering, 
uh, as it relates to automotive, the automotive industry. So they're the, you know, the overarching regulator for all automotive manufacturers. So about four years in, um, and as you know, some of you know, with working in the federal space, uh, you can be really constricted to the way you approach things. There's a lot of red tape to cut through. Uh, and it kind of just got really frustrating to me because you know, our focus was safety. And I was like, there's a really smart way to do this. And because this gets politicized, now I can't do it this way. So me and another uh, coworker at NHTSA kind of saw that there were outside consultants doing similar work within the automotive industry. And so we kind of took the leap of faith and left the federal space, which a lot of people still think I'm a little crazy for, because <laughs> you know, all those great benefits, but um, it allowed me to really approach uh, these type of topics in a much different manner. And I feel like I can be more impactful in the safety space with automotive engineering, so. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Just another side note, I wanted to tell everyone, if you guys do have specific questions you want us to talk about, please feel free to throw them in the chat. Uh, we do have questions that we are going to run through and keep going through, but if you think of anything, put it in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll discuss it with the panel. Um, everyone in here kind of gave a little bit of advice, but I guess my next question was going to be, like, what helped you the most in pivoting? And, and maybe there was someone you knew who had done it already that you talked to, or... Um, if there's like a single resource that helps you, and this, this can be industry specific. Um, I don't know if any of you took classes before pivoting or, yeah, so what, what helped you the most? I'll jump in and just say that I think, um, and this is probably like a, a big piece of advice that I would give to uh, either people thinking about a transition in their career or people looking for jobs or recent grads or even students, is to seek counsel. Um, I had no idea. I don't have any other lawyers really in my family. And so when I made a change from engineering to law, it was a little scary because I, I really had no idea what the heck I was doing. And so... Um, talking to friends and colleagues and relatives with experience and um, all kinds of different people. And just really like, just going to them honestly and just saying, uh, I'm thinking about making this change, what do you think? And just open-ended questions and trying to seek counsel from others. Uh, you, you really, it's, it's, it's tremendous, the, the encouragement that you'll get from others and also the good, solid, practical advice that you'll get from others. I remember like one of the best pieces of advice that I was ever given when I first started my engineering career is by my father, who I had a lot of opportunities. I was lucky. I started my career in post 9-11 New York when like recovery was starting to happen. So jobs were ample and I uh, had a few offers. And I remember him asking because I was leaning one way, which was paying more. And I was just going to make the decision based on that. Um, and he was like, well, where did you feel the most comfortable? And where I felt the most comfortable was actually the job that paid the least. And he was like, go there absolutely go there. And it was the best advice I've ever gotten. Um, it really was. And so I had a, a tremendous, I still have friends at that, uh, at that engineering firm to this day. And so my advice would be um, seek counsel, uh, not professional counsel, unless that's your thing. Um, but uh, yeah, just talk to friends, talk to colleagues, talk to relatives, talk to networking, uh, you know, opportunities and things like that. And so uh, advice is, is golden. I'd also awesome. say, like, don't be afraid to, uh, like, kind of let things go and, like, kind of get over your fear of rejection. So even when we started the company, we had this idea of what we wanted it to be. And going into it, we realized, like, okay, we're trying to sell this thing and nobody wants it. Uh, <laughs> and so we kind of, like, pivoted again and started really figuring out, okay, what is it that people want? And then kind of just kind of molding ourselves into that space. And like, we're continuing to do that. Um, so like I'm getting out of the commercial space now and now we're starting to go after like federal contracts. So it's just like kind of not being afraid to kind of see what's not working and just don't worry about dropping that idea and just moving on to the next one. Great advice. Um, I think one of mine was, um, it had to, it's more so like personal, everyone's different. Um, but mine was that someone was like, you know, you don't want to go straight into your master's or your graduate degree if you don't really know what you want to do. Like, don't do it just because it's something to do. Um, obviously, if you know you want to do it, go for it, right? But 
I didn't know. I didn't know what I wanted <clears throat> my master's in. I just knew I wasn't going to do mechanical engineering. Um, <laughs> I went into management, so I like didn't really do mechanical ever. Um, uh, but I think waiting and giving me like having three years to just think about what I'm interested in. And I worked in the realm that I was interested in, right? I did environmental management. Um, uh, and just to be able to see like what's out there at first I thought maybe energy but then I got into like this watery system with the army and it was super interesting um and that's kind of like where I went and I just it was great to get that experience because I find that I enjoyed grad I loved going to grad school and I think it's because you're older and you actually are interested in it you're not there because you want to go to school you're there because you want to learn those things and you want to ex exceed succeed in those things and actually learn and I think it makes a big difference especially since your brain has been in school for four years it's really hard to just keep going I think that break really helps um to kind of kind of have you be able to focus on what you actually want to do um so I I love my master's program um so I, I think part of it's because I waited I think I have the benefit of having kind of the the, the perspectives from Tom Emily and Carol and I really would you know echo all of their sentiments. I mean, uh, just like Carol mentioned, I, I went to grad school right after Maryland and I knew really what my passion was, which was, it's funny, it's the same area that Carol's in. Uh, it's in what I was doing, hydraulic engineering, water chemistry. Um, definitely plus one to what Carol said. Um, I would, in my opinion, not encourage grad school as a, me as a means to buy time. Um, it's definitely something that's a, a big commitment. But from a career perspective, I was always kind of, my passion was water and, and the environment. And there was a definite crossroads where there was opportunities to kind of what Tom had mentioned, the solicit advice, career advice on, do I want to go down that path permanently or are there opportunities to explore something else? And I was always hesitant to take that, explore something else because I knew what my passion was. But there were certain role models that I had that, uh, and mentors, professional mentors, um, where I really got their advice and perspective. And they kind of gave me a simple, simple advice is, if you don't try, you won't know. And that was kind of the impetus for me to try something new. And there was always the, I guess, reassurance that if it's not working out, you can go back to, or, you know, recalibrate. So I guess long story short, I'd say, I think the thing for me that was most impactful was kind of being open to that, taking that leap and knowing that you have that all of us from Maryland going through the, the Clark School have that technical know-how and background to, to leverage and to, to fall back on um, in areas that you might not be, you might not think you're, you're comfortable with initially. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it seems like in summary from all of you, um, similar experiences with with letting go or not being scared to get out of your comfort zone. And yeah, just don't forget, we're all engineers and we love to problem solve. So just throwing yourself out there is fine. It's obviously very scary, but uh, an engineering degree has prepared you for that. So you made it through that. Um, okay, so switching gears just a little bit. Um, I'm not exactly sure for everyone that's on this call what your status is, but we did want to talk about this one question about, let's just say right now you, you don't have a job or maybe you're about to pivot to a new job and it hasn't started, or maybe uh, a job that you have is being delayed because of coronavirus, or maybe you're a current student and you don't have, you know, your internship was canceled. We know a lot of things have happened. All of us have experienced that at our own companies uh, between job cuts or salary cuts. Um, so anyways, our, our question to the panelists is, what would you be doing right now if you did not uh, have a job that was starting right this moment and you had time either to better yourself uh, for your upcoming job or, or because you're looking for a job? Um, feel free, you know, if we want to start reverse, Josh, if you want to go first this time. Absolutely. Um... The thing that comes to mind to me is certification, specifically um, the, I remember finishing up undergrad, the FE was something that um, was a big help for me. You kind of focusing on that and getting that under, having that as a tool in my tool belt um, right after finishing up um, the bachelor's degree, because there's really, even if you don't go down the design route um, and you find that out later, later on, 
you have the flexibility, you have the FE already completed and you have the flexibility to go for the PE down the road if you so choose. So I, I think what's coming to mind to me is really taking a look at, look critically at the certifications um, that are out there um, and kind of fo focusing on that. Yeah, just to clarify for everyone, FE is your fundamentals of engineering and PE is your professional engineer. Um, oh, thanks. I should have clarified. Yeah. So yeah, I'm assuming most people know, but just to make sure. Yeah. Kind of like the, the first stage and then you have, uh, you almost be like in an apprentice stage for a couple of years before you can sit for the, the PE. Yeah, certifications are great. Some other certifications out there are the PMP is a big one um, through PMI, which is Project Management Institute, has a bunch of certifications and PMP is Project Management Professional. Another big certification body is ASQ. American Society of Quality, and then we know that like SolidWorks, a bunch of the computer aid design, they all have certifications. So yeah, I just to echo the certifications. I guess I would, okay. Uh, so I would say um, either like what you're doing now, like join an alumni association or another industry group. I know I'm a part of the DC board for SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers. And it's a great networking opportunity. It's free. And I mean, I've gotten work out of being a part of that board because I'm, you know, networking and communicating with all these automotive manufacturers and people that work for these companies. Now they know what I do. And I've had people reach out to me through the board uh, to do work for their company. So it's a good opportunity for you to see what other opportunities are out there. I definitely think networking is big. It's a little hard right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, even even if it's just like spending a day going through LinkedIn and seeing who you know or like who you know knows, um, and just kind of seeing what their career paths are like, and just messaging them if if you're interested in what they're doing. Um, another big one is just to like volunteer um, with whatever organization is out there. Right now, there's a million places to volunteer because it's people aren't going out, right? Uh, obviously, if you don't want to, then that's a different thing. But um, you can always just eat, like a lot, nonprofits are always looking, as we're working from one, uh, working for one, uh, we're always looking for volunteers to do anything. So um, it's always a, a route to go if, if you can't find a job or if you just have some free time between whatever you're doing now too. Yeah, and my, my advice, I kind of have like two pieces of advice here of what I would probably be doing. One is, um, and they're related to one another. Uh, one is I'd probably be applying for anything and everything, like any, any job listing I saw um, that was somewhat related to what I wanted to do or what I have experience in or what I have a degree in, um, I would apply for it. I think there was like an old school thought, at least it was when I, when I was younger, of uh, you could be blackballed by a company if you applied for a job that maybe you weren't qualified for, or um, even if you applied for a job that you were qualified for, if you didn't get it, then it'd be harder to get a job at that company later on. I, I think that's, one, I think it's it's garbage, uh, and two, like personally, uh, and two, I think it's an old school thought that's not at all compatible with the times that we're living through. And I think like employers right now would understand if you're applying for jobs that maybe you weren't qualified for. And maybe you can even say so in your cover letter. I know you're looking for a mid-level person here. Um, I would be more junior, but here's why I think I'd be a good fit. Here's why I'm passionate about working in this area. Here's why I think I'm really moldable and could be of, of value to your company. So I would, I would definitely be doing that. And then somewhat related to it is that I know this from my patent attorney experience is that there are a lot of startups and young companies out there that are looking for people on an independent contractor basis. And so there are, with a technical degree, there are a lot of opportunities to come into a young company and work a few hours a week doing whatever they do. And a lot of those companies won't have necessarily advertised online or otherwise that they're hiring because they won't be looking for full-time people. But if you know of those kind of companies in your area, it's it's probably worth like reaching out to them to see like, hey, I just graduated with a degree in you know electrical engineering and you're in the cybersecurity industry. Is there anything like I could help out with? Like I live close by or I'm com comfortable with telework and that kind of thing. And and I would be I would be kind of looking at like anywhere and everywhere where I could earn some income. That would be me personal. That's great advice about the contracting. We've never thought of that. Yeah, just like kind of doing odd ends for anyone. 
Um, and you really build a rapport doing that because companies have this like, they want to know what everyone's doing, but they can't know that <laughs> unless they bring someone in that's seen other stuff. I'm sure Emily can relate. Um, yeah, thank you everyone. That's great advice. I think, you know, the most important thing is just putting yourself out there. Um, the more you connect yourself to others, whether it's just helping a neighbor or volunteering or working, the more people you meet and do, it just it compounds on itself. Like building relationships is a compounding event. Uh, the more you build, they just will keep increasing and that throughout your career will always help you. Um, all right. I think we'll uh, we'll shift gears a little bit to something really current right now. So obviously everyone here, I think, is working from like a home office at the moment. And obviously we are in this crazy time of teleworking uh, for everyone pretty much. And, you know, we, we feel like it would be really challenging to start off a new job as virtual because usually you have a chance to develop these relationships with people in person before going virtual and so you know my question to the panel is what is your advice for like one working virtual just right now in general what helps you the most and two if you were to start a new career or a new job all virtual what would you do to ensure that starts off well And we can go, Tom, you want to, we can go back to the reverse order. Tom, you can start first. Sure, sure. I, I sympathize with, um, you know, people starting new careers in this time period because it. I, I benefited so much and this is, uh, you know, probably not useful to know, but I benefited so much from the personal interaction when I started my career, how I could, uh, you know, when I was an engineer, I was in a cubicle and so I could just ask the person in the cubicle next to me what I was, you know, what I needed to do, how they would do something. Um, and then same thing in a law firm, like I was able to go down the hall or, you know, at a different floor and ask a lawyer with experience what to do. Um, but I think like, because you're going to lose that in this current kind of work from home environment, it's just all the more important to keep those channels of communication open. Um, for me personally, like now, um, shout out to Josh and Google. I love like Gchat right now for work with colleagues like me and my paralegal are on gchat all day long talking about you know and there's other ones like slack that other companies use um, and microsoft tools so i would just you know try to keep those lines of communication as open as possible it's a little hard because you won't know if you're annoying someone because you can't really see the, their facial expression but um i would just you know try to do a hat in hand approach when when you're reaching out to people especially at a more senior level um maybe acknowledge like i'm, I'm sorry to bother you but and then lead off with like whatever question you have Yeah, going off of what Tom said, I, I do think the visually seeing somebody is really nice uh, because you kind of, you get a better sense, right? Communication is like 30% work, 70% social cues. Um, but, um, but I like to call, when I call people, I almost always video call my coworkers um, so that I, I think I've, I've done it enough so that they know every time Carol is calling that it'll be a video. So they're expecting me to call. They're like, not like disheveled, but um, obviously don't surprise them. <laughs> um, but um, I think that that really helps kind of just get a rapport with the people, especially if you haven't, haven't worked, if you have never met these people in person, that, that's really hard to do to kind of see like, what did they mean by that email? It's like, they meant nothing, right? Like, you just know that person's a nice person or maybe that person's a very direct person. They don't mean it meanly, right? It's just a bunch of different things that you can't, you can't gather through an email. Um, so I, I, I always like video calls to kind of get that sense of people. Definitely echo those sentiments as well. I mean, 95% um, of the meetings that we have at work, it's highly encouraged to have video for those same reasons. Um, I think one thing that, and Tom said it really well, that these are incredibly, um, they're truly unprecedented times. But if there's one thing that might be a reassurance to like a new graduate, is I think that, you know, the experience that we're going through is really going to make work from home or has made work from home going to be a, a, a norm. And kind of this, we're kind of all in this together, but the skills that you're going to pick up of working remotely, I think, um, will serve you well throughout your career. Um, one thing that's really helped me is scheduling, like if you're starting a new job, is scheduling a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, like a dedicated maybe half hour session to kind of talk, to have a QA and a session with uh, you know, my manager or, or career mentor. Um, you know, if, if 
the uh, the manager is, is willing to do that, it's it's definitely a helpful time to kind of spitball ideas or just have a ton of questions on, hey, I'm not necessarily sure on this concept. Can you maybe describe it a little bit more? So hopefully there's some level of reassurance that um, working from home, like the skills that you pick up now will serve you well, I think, for the long term. Yeah, and I mean, I've always worked from home since starting the business. So we, um, you know, we have like a virtual office space that we use ad hoc. But um, since we started, I've always been doing the work from home. So when all of this happened, I was like, oh, this is just like my normal day to day. Um, but I know that it's like some people really struggle with the structure and kind of scheduling. And it's, um, you know, people worry that you get really distracted at home. So for me, like lists are like to do lists are my like number one thing or like purposely scheduling that like I'll usually have like a whiteboard behind me right now and it has like all the things that I want to accomplish like within that week and it's I just make it a thing to make sure I'm crossing off everything on that list. So definitely like find what works for you but figure out something that kind of keeps your day a little bit more structured and I feel like it lets that you know work from home kind of flow a little bit better. Awesome. All great advice. I'll add one thing that I heard recently, uh, actually from my brother who's in sales, um, who does like a lot of phone calls. He told me, um, you talk better as a person when you think that you're talking to other people. And so if you're ever on a phone call and you're looking at a wall, it, like that doesn't do as well. So he suggests um, either putting a mirror in front of you. So like right now, if someone were to talk and they weren't on video screen, but they have a mirror in front of them and they're looking at themselves as they're talking, they can see their own facial expressions. That helps you talk better. Um, and, and so even if uh, at my company, like people don't like to video chat, I always turn video on so I can see myself. Um, and that's for as I present or as I talk to other people, because it does help you like articulate better. Some, I don't know what the psychology is behind that, but um, it's very helpful. So just try that next time and see if that helps you feel more comfortable uh, while communicating with other people. Um, all right. If anyone has any questions they want to jump in, otherwise we'll, we'll keep going. But um, we're just going to talk more about some other advice we have for networking and uh, I just yeah. thought of something, Bridget. Sorry, yeah. um, but this goes to what we were talking about before, like advice. Um, I've benefited in my career from mentor-mentee relationships. So what I would suggest also is like, at whatever company you're working at, um, if they have one of those, uh, you know, like preordained, like here's your mentor, utilize it. And if they don't, maybe suggest that they do, even if it's a smaller company, um, that if there's like, it kind of goes to what Josh is saying, that could kind of work out the scheduling and awkwardness of that for you is if they do have a mentor mentee sort of program then i would assume that as part of that program there'll probably be like a set time and, and place where you, you can meet with your mentor and ask questions and and it'll be in my opinion uh valuable uh every time great advice yeah the only other thing i can think of for virtual um something my company does is we have a breakfast club. So we used to meet in person on Fridays and we someone would bring in breakfast. A lot of times it's just Dunkin' Donuts. So when we went virtual, we still had the meeting scheduled and we we're like, oh crap, like we don't, I don't know, what should we do? So we all hopped on a Zoom call and we were, everyone was at their houses and everyone just ate breakfast and talked. And so I think it's really important, especially if you're on a team or just working with on a project with a group of people, um, you're missing that time at the water cooler or other times you might just chat with people about outside of work stuff. And that's really important uh, for developing relationships at work. And so, yeah, I've heard of some other big time companies where the CEO does like coffee with uh, impromptu coffee with uh, random people in the company just to talk about whatever. So don't be afraid to uh, propose that at your work or with friends uh, to do that because I, I think that FaceTime is really important. And you know, people can have their kids in the video. It's it's fine. We've had people like making pancakes uh, while on the video. So everything, anything like that is helpful. Yeah, I, just to add on to that, my my work, we started a water cooler chat. So we use um, Teams um, and little, it's literally called water cooler chat. Um, so uh, awesome. uh, it's like we post like funny memes or like pictures of what we did this weekend. And like my, my one coworker, Ari, he was like, uh, I'll be right back. Got to take care of bats. And we're like, what are you talking about? Legit, like there was a bat stuck on his, on the side of his house and he had to go save it. He sent us pictures and he sent us a video of him feeding the little, little, little bat. Right. And so I was like, those little things, it's like work, 
my work used to be really fun because my coworkers are great and I love working with them. But working from home when you don't have that Tulsa atmosphere, it just makes it more mundane and you kind of lose a lot of the fun stuff. Um, and so just having things like the, the chat room and be able to read it throughout work and whenever you want, you don't have to, you know, be on and on the whole time, but um, just have some funny things that everyone shares. It's always it's just nice to kind of be like, oh, right, there's life. It's not just about work. Awesome. I like that they call Microsoft Teams calls it water cooler. That's great. Or you guys called it water cooler. I don't know. Um, all right. Let's, uh, we kind of touched on networking a little bit, like what is best for networking, right? We talked about, um, you know, joining the Alumni Association, going to events like this is like a networking event. You've met all of us, uh, volunteering, just helping others. So let's talk about, um, We've kind of already answered this, but we'll run through it again in case there's anything different. Reflecting on your career, can you talk about what is the most impactful lessons learned just in your career in general? Yeah, so I, I probably going to sound like a broken record, but um, it was just the greatest lesson learned for me was openness. Like I, you know, finishing undergrad, I had a whole path kind of planned out. I like to plan. I like to to forecast things and whatnot. And I thought, you know, a trajectory was going to go a certain way. And then reflecting back on it, life has a way of just throwing unexpected curveballs to you. Um, and I think the greatest lesson learned for me was to embrace the change um, or the potential for change um, and going down a, an unexpected path. I think Carol or, or Emily had mentioned this before of taking that leap is not easy. And there's a lot of um, maybe self-doubt or um, pressure that, you know, is natural to be placed on, on yourself. But kind of cutting through that and just taking that leap, I think, is, for me, was the most impactful lesson learned. And that things tend to work out in the end. Um, and if things don't, aren't going quite so well, there's always the opportunity to, to change again and to recalibrate again. So um, that, that's what stands out most to me. That's great I, mean, I definitely agree with Josh because when I um, talk to my friends about going to grad school and I only apply out of state. I was like, I'm leaving where like, I, I grew up, I was born and raised here, but I was like, let me try something different. It's, a, it's, also like, it's, a, it's like the only opportunity where you can move somewhere very short term and see if you like it. And just, it's a completely different world, right? Having born and raised in Maryland. Um, uh, but people were like, why would you do that? Like, why would you just up and leave your career? And like, I had a stable job. I was not going to get fired. Like military, you know, like working for the army, you always have a job. Like, um, but they were, they were just so like perplexed and it made me doubt myself, but it really is just like, if you believe that you're, you can do it, like, don't let other people make you doubt yourself and and it's okay to fail you know I, I know that as engineers we don't like to <laughs> we have this like we like plans and we like succeeding we're always really good at what we do um but it's okay that if, if that can happen um but if it's the path that you want to take just you you can you should believe in yourself and just do do that thing yeah my company we kind of have this mantra of like you're gonna hear about 10, 10 no's before you get the one yes. And you just kind of have to get used to that and just sit with it. Um, so, I, you know, for me, it's like, don't fear rejection. Like, you know, you're gonna get some no's and just let those pass by and then, you know, wait until you get into to your yes. And I know we've talked about this a little bit before, but um, don't be afraid to oversell yourself a little bit. Uh, like we were saying, you know, just because you might not be going down the exact path you chose as like, in, like for me like a mechanical engineering you know if you pivot into something else you know you have all those technical skills like don't be afraid to kind of oversell that a little bit more you know just because it's not exactly what you went to school for doesn't mean you don't have the capability to do it yeah and i think um just kind of going off on that uh is you got to be, I think like one of the most impactful things that I've learned, and I learned it early on in my engineering career, was to, to be 
honest um, with uh, and, and be humble about not knowing something and it's okay to not know something and that could be hard for engineers as well. Um, the answer, I will get back to you about that is always acceptable most of the time. Um, and so, yeah, so if like you're, don't assume that just because you don't know something that that makes you an idiot. Um, it just makes you a little less experienced in that area and ask questions. And so um, honestly, just being open and honest and asking a lot of questions, I'd say has, has really uh, been beneficial to, to me. And that would probably be like my most impactful thing I can think of. Yeah. Well, going off of that, I think one of the, sorry, <laughs> Oh, it's fine. I said, if you say, if you go in saying you know everything, you're probably lying, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I was gonna say that um, I, when I first started, I really struggled with asking questions and like, because I always, I didn't want to sound like an idiot. Is it that like, um, uh, what's the, what's the saying with the, the duck syndrome? Imposter syndrome. Um, you know, you don't want to, you're afraid that you have imposter syndrome. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things that I, I think that now that I mentor other people that I notice is that there's a difference between intelligence and experience. And asking questions because you don't have experience is completely valid you don't have that experience. You can't act like you have it when you don't. But intelligence, you will always have that. If you believe in yourself and, and you're a smart person, you, that's not what people are doubting, right? So it's just knowing that asking questions does not mean you're dumb. It just means you don't have that experience of knowing that thing and you will eventually get that experience. I think it helps me set my mind and be like, I'm not an idiot, right? Like, I, I know I'm a smart person. I want everyone else to know I'm a smart person. You know, it's just, I think it just shifts the, the mindset to be okay with asking questions. Yeah, I mean... I would agree that asking asking questions is a is a sign of strength, right? That you are um, confident in yourself enough that you're going to go ask someone for help, and that's a that's a strength to feel comfortable with doing that. And when people come to me and ask questions, I I I value them like people that I I I respect them even more for asking. Um, and so I think that's something for you to understand that asking questions is a good thing in your career, and people will usually always respect that. Yeah, and, and this is kind of, of making me reflect right after, you know, finishing up school. Like, I, thinking about it, like, the Clark School gave us, gave me the tools to think critically. But, you know, the actual day-to-day -day tasks in, especially my first job, I, you know, I knew the concepts of pipeline design, but I never did it before. Like, you learn things theoretical in school, but then on the first job, it's applied. And the expectation is that, like, you know, you can think critically, but the expectation is that you... Um, you don't know uh, the day-to-day -day role and it just takes time and takes experience kind of like what, what Carol was saying. So asking questions, it's not a, a dumb thing or a, or a poor reflection on, on you in particular. I think um, what Bridget just said, it's, it's quite contrary. It's, it's a really positive thing. Great thing. Plus asking them early is much better than asking them later. <laughs> like if you're asking a question that could be considered a dumb question in year one in your career, there's a big difference between doing that in year one versus year seven, um, when then maybe you are an idiot because you didn't ask it earlier. So I wouldn't be shy. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And one other thing I wanted to go off of what Josh said earlier about uh, being open to new things. There's like a famous quote from Mike Tyson of all people everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? So like, you know, you might go out of high school into college saying, this is exactly what I'm going to do. I, I have this whole plan lined up perfectly. And then all of a sudden, like something happens, it's all out the window. Just like a lot of people have plans and then coronavirus came. <laughs> so um, just always looking at it in a light of new opportunities instead of a negative light, I think is just people who think of it that way, I think do better. Um, adjusting to that. So um, I kind of want to segue into this whole about you don't know. I think Josh was talking about in school, he learned this. Um, segues into our next question of what practical things have you learned from school that have helped you the most in your engineering career or your current career that maybe isn't engineering specifically? I guess I'll start. Um, thinking critically was, I think that was just the skill that was inherent to the I think in any, any engineering program. Um, so like right now I'm doing more electrical engineering, like fiber optics, which I had no clue about. Um, but I was able to tie fiber optic design to some of the concepts I learned in hydraulics and in, in the water resources courses at Maryland. So it's not necessarily like, uh, you know, a, a like for like um, translation to what I learned in school to now what I'm doing in my career. But 
it laid the framework and the groundwork to think about things differently. And I don't know, like I, I always wondered when I switched to engineering, I was originally an environmental science major, um, why I needed to take Calc 3. Like, was I really going to be doing multivariable calculus in, in, in the job world? And the short answer is no. But more, more importantly, I learned that it made me, taking those courses made me think a different way, think differently about things or approach problems in a different way. So the long story short for me is there wasn't really a particular class. Um, it was the whole combination of the program that uh, I went through that gave me the tools to think, think differently. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but. No, that's good. Uh, I mean, I think, I think that's a practical advice. Um, you know, maybe some people are using direct skills. I don't know, but I would agree. A lot of times you're just learning a problem solving methodology. Anyone else have any specific things that they feel like they've carried uh, other than the problem solving critical thinking? I can piggyback on what Josh said a little bit in that um, I've, I've kind of learned because I, I need to know in my current career, right, uh, if I'm working on inventions in different industries by their very nature, they got to be new. Um, and so I need to know uh, a little about a lot rather than a lot about a little. So I need like a broad knowledge base. And so what engineering school did was kind of provide me with the tools to be able to learn different things and so that's what you have like you're not going to be an expert after you graduate you're not going to be able to to apply the theory of all these sciences that you learned in school to whatever career it is it's going to be pretty particular and um, very different from what you learned in school but but because you were able to learn all that hard stuff in school you are certainly going to be able to learn almost everything that that is thrown at you in the real world and so just kind of knowing that you have this like it's within you the, the knowledge base you just have to kind of explore it and then you'll get there and so um yeah and so it, it really has just like laid the foundation for you to be able to to learn and grow in whatever career path you choose yeah, to add to that i um so i took i took the fe when i was uh, right after college then i took the pe and i i took water resources or environment i don't remember exact water resources engineering but i'm not a civil engineer so if everybody knows the pe in in it water resources is under civil so the first four hours is all civil i didn't know a single thing <laughs> like, i didn't do i may have taken one structure class don't know anything about concrete don't know anything about steel and so like i had to cram a lot and i think that the experience at maryland of like cramming um, <laughs> really helped me actually be able to pass the test because I had to know so much in such a short amount of time and granted I've forgotten everything um, by now but it's that it's, it's that ability to retain that information and know how to apply it um, whether it what, perhaps in my mind just very short term um, but you know it, it's always somewhere back there I being able like everything is a fundamental right in college and everything builds off of that so just having that fundamental knowledge even though i've never learned about steel i know about you know certain other aspects of materials um and that really helps with that and um, the other thing i think that at college it helped this is i was in the quest program and that was um engineers and business students together and i think that really helped me although i still struggle with this but it helped me communicate my feelings and my thoughts. Um, I think engineers tend to sometimes struggle with communicating with other people. And I think in Quest, I had to break down the more technical things to explain to a business person who doesn't understand the technical part. I, I, I struggled with that, but I think that was a good thing for me to realize that I wasn't good at it so that I could continue to work on it. It's like, it's not that they're dumb. They know something way more than I do. It's just the thing that I know a lot about, they don't. And so to be able to convey the information well, I think is something that um, I started learning at Maryland. And kind of to add to that, just working in groups in general, like I think Maryland was really good about kind of facilitating, you know, group work and, you know, you carry that over in your career then too. It's, it's always helpful to, you know, kind of, you know, two brains is better than one. And the more people you add into it, the, the better you can be about solving those problems. Great advice. You'll always be working in groups. All right, so that's about it for our questions. So I just, I really do want to open up to the participants. If you have specific questions for a certain panelist or you have a general question for the group, please feel free. Um, 
I have a funny anecdote I can share in the meantime um, yeah. about just like rah-rah engineering school and how it can prepare you is that uh, like for me, and I think it would be the same for almost everyone is uh, like law school compared to studying engineering at University of Maryland was a freaking breeze. And so like if you could get through that curriculum, you really can get through a lot. Like it, I, I went to law school at night with a full-time job during the day. I thought I was going to fail out because I was dedicating like no time to it compared to the amount I studied for engineering. But what you learn is like you actually learned how to study. I would go to the library and watch everyone like shopping online, chatting with friends. I would go in three hours bang out everything I needed to do and leave and everyone be like oh there goes Tom he's gonna fail like he didn't even study and it'd be like I actually studied while you guys goofed off the whole time and so engineering school prepared me in a way to, to be able to study and cram valuable skills I, I like to tell people that if you made it through engineering school you can do anything you're like you were taught determination <laughs> And another thing is that I think at Maryland, um, which hopefully being remote or working in a virtual space won't decrease this, but it's just like the friends and the connections you make there. It's such a big school and and I have so many friends from engineering school because it was hard, right? <laughs> you suffered with all of your friends together studying to like, you know, who knows when, working on these projects until break of dawn, trying to finish things before your presentation in the morning. Um, and I think that those connections are, are, are very, very important too. Um, and just having those, those friends that went through that, that same thing with you, so. That's great. Sounds like no questions yet, which is fine. We've covered a lot. So, um, you know, if people think of questions later or as we're talking here, um, I'll just sum up what's gonna happen after this since we're only eight minutes from one, and I know people have work to get back to. Um, we'll try to summarize some of our ideas and, and we'll throw out a, a document that we'll post on social media for everyone to see that will kind of summarize some of our answers to these questions with links to information um, and any, any other thing we think of. We're also gonna put a summary of our favorite life hacks. So uh, any of our favorite apps that help us the most. Um, and yeah, we'll put that out there for everyone to access. We'll also have links to our LinkedIn's um, so you can reach out to us through there too. Um, so yeah, and hopefully if you ever wanna re-listen to this, we'll have this re recording available somehow through the University of Maryland Alumni Association. Yeah, uh, sounds like a great idea, Tom. If everyone <laughs> wants to go around and just give some, any last thoughts, anything, just to sum it all up. Yeah, I just wanted to to say, like, in summary to people, anyone that's listening to this, um, watching this, that, or the recorded version that's going through a tough time, like everyone is, um, and it's, it's tough. Everyone kind of recognizes that. And so I know personally, like, if I'm ever in a hiring position, which I should be, uh, you know, in the future, and I ever see, like, class of 2020 on a resume, I'm going to give that person a leg up um, almost always, and that'll probably carry into 2021, and that's high school, college, even graduate school and so um, we're all in this together in this crazy world that we're living in and so it's it's tough out there and I know I personally sympathize with it and um, and I think a lot of other people too do too uh, I'll, I'll say add something else um, I think that I think all, almost all of us are involved in the alumni association somehow um, and I think that networking wise it's a really good place to start um i've met so many people and i think a few of us are on different boards um it's super fun one i i love it <laughs> um but it's also it's really a good way to network and meet other people and even if it's not engineering um it, you meeting other people outside of your your um Discipline is actually really helpful because you get a better scope of what's happening elsewhere. Kind of like, like Tom just switched, he doesn't need energy anymore, right? Like um, having somebody that might've gone through that same experience, just, just hearing other people's experiences and learning from them, I think is a kind of just a great way to build your, yourself and definitely your career, but also just personal skills too. Anyone else? Final thoughts? I can leave you with my, my favorite uh, quote. 
Perfect. So it's our work quote. Uh, if you want to achieve greatness, stop asking for permission. So it's kind of like our business mantra. It's a good one. Yeah, uh, same vein is um, persistent, like never give up. Um, I know that's a lot easier said than done, um, but we will get through these times. Um, just try and persist as best as you can. Um, uh, yeah, that's really just what comes to mind. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna take really quick before I forget, I'm gonna take a picture for this of our little panel. So everyone just smile, look normal. All right, on three. One, two, three. All right. Thank you all. I have that, saving that. Um, what social platforms? Okay, so Erica, thank you for answering. Uh, so we'll probably post this on Frederick County Terps. Um, and then Carol will probably reshare with Engineering Terps um, and Engineering Alumni Association groups. So yeah, first on Frederick Terps, then whoever shares it after that. And Frederick Terps, we're on both uh, Facebook and Instagram. And Instagram, we're frederick.terps. So give us a follow if you haven't already. Um, all right, well, I'm... See if any other chats. Um, yes, thank you for forwarding that, Erica. Yes, go for it, Dave. Um, do I have to unmute you? All right, can you hear me? Yes. So I, I just wanted to say on behalf of everybody listening in, thank you. Um, you did an awesome job with this, Bridget, moderating. Everybody on here, Tom, Emily, Carol, Josh, thank you. This, this is an invaluable resource. And Tom, you were talking earlier about, you know, finding mentors, people that you can go to that help you guide. Well, here's five mentors available. Um, I know when people reach out to me on LinkedIn that are, you know, in my industry and want to have questions and I see they want to Maryland, instantly i, I want to help them out i'm sure all of you feel that same way so if you're trying to network and trying to get into careers use the resources terps will help terps um you know there's so thank you everybody for doing this i really appreciate that thanks dave for your closing notes i think we'll just i think we'll end on that <laughs> all right